Did you know that Colgate is the only brand in the world that is bought by more than half of all households on earth? Let that sink in for a moment. Over 50% of the households in the world. You know what number two in the world is? Coca-Cola. Colgate has a 42% market share of all toothpaste sales. It's so popular in the Philippines that they use the brand name Colgate as the generic word for toothpaste. And you know that Colgate holds a Guinness World Record? Stay tuned to hear all about that plus other amazing things, like that they have paid a dividend for 124 consecutive years and raised it for 57, making it only one of 27 prestigious companies in the world to be a dividend king. That is insane. It feels like it has the safety of a treasury bond, but unlike a fixed coupon, it has consecutively increased their payout for over half a century. What's up, everybody? Gen X Dividend Investor here. Today, in my 11th stock reveal video, I'll be doing a deep analysis of Colgate Palmolive, my 15th largest dividend stock by portfolio value. That means that after this, I only have 14 to go until my full dividend investing portfolio is revealed. Keep watching to see screenshots of the Colgate Palmolive dividend checks I recently received. And I have a favor to ask you. Please share this video with your Aunt Sally, or with that crazy coworker you know, or with LeBron James. Who knows, maybe he will tweet it and it'll go viral. Feel free to check out the timestamps in the description below if you just want to jump straight to my portfolio. Though it would mean the world to me if you watched or listened to the whole video, as that's the best way to show you appreciate my efforts. As always, this video is not a recommendation to buy, sell, or hold. I'm just sharing my thoughts as someone who isn't a professional licensed investor. Okay, as my Aussie viewers might say, brace yourself, Sheila. It's time for some deep analysis. Colgate Palmolive, ticker CL, is a $59 billion American multinational consumer products company that sells in over 200 countries and territories around the world and was founded in 1806. How many companies do you know of that have been operating for 213 years? Not only does Colgate have the best toothpaste market share out there, but they are also our number one in manual toothbrushes worldwide, number two in mouthwash worldwide, number one in liquid hand soap, number two in bar soaps and liquid body cleansing, number two in liquid fabric conditioners, number two in hand washing, and their Hills Pet Nutrition is number one market share in vet clinics in the U.S. They sell many well-known products such as Colgate Toothpaste, Speed Stick Deodorant, Irish Spring Hand and Body Soap, Palmolive Dish Soap, Ajax, and a bunch of others you would recognize. We use all of those at my house, and in fact, I have a few dentist friends, and many of them say that Colgate is the best toothpaste out there, though some say Crest is. I actually grew up in a Crest household, though I remember Pepsodent was actually my favorite. Quick side note about Pepsodent is that it, it has been owned by Unilever since 1942, except in the U.S. and Canada, where since 2003 it has been owned by Church & Dwight. Not only do I use Colgate every day, but I also use Irish Spring every day, which has been my favorite bar soap for decades, and I use Speed Stick frequently, though I've never really been brand loyal to one deodorant, as I've always liked to mix it up. Colgate Palmolive has a market cap of $59 billion and revenues of around $15 billion, with over 34,000 employees. Morningstar tells us that CL's top institutional holder is Vanguard, which holds almost 9% of Colgate Palmolive at almost 77 million shares. The largest individual shareholder I found was Ian Cook, their chairman and CEO, who holds over 1 million shares worth around $70 million. That means that his shares drip around $1.8 million a year of passive income. And then for reference, we see that I hold 651 shares of Colgate Palmolive. Another interesting data point is that in 2018, there were about 22,000 common shareholders of record of CL stock. So that means that there are about 22,000 of us in the world that are holding Colgate Palmolive in our brokerage accounts. Cool, huh? Okay, let's look into their key competitors. They have a variety of great competitors, and here are just a few. Of course, you can add Kimberly Clark, Procter & Gamble, and Johnson & Johnson to this list. I'm going to use another great American company that was established in the 1800s and utilize Church & Dwight, ticker CHD, to compare and contrast them against. Church & Dwight own a variety of brands you have no doubt heard of, such as Trojan Condoms, Arm & Hammer Baking Soda, which their corporate logo was based on, OxyClean, and Nair Hair Remover, amongst others. 
They are a $4.2 billion company founded in 1846 and are one of the fastest growing consumer packaged goods companies that has outpaced the standard of Poor's by more than 3x over the last 10 years. In fact, they've been growing so strong that they were added to the S&P 500 list in 2016. I won't spend time going over the CPG industry because I think it's relatively easy to understand the basics of how consumer staples works. CL is ranked 202 on the Fortune 500 of the largest public U.S. companies by revenue, and CHD is ranked 612. So CHD didn't make the top 500, but did make the top 1,000. Neither are big enough to rank on the Fortune Global 500 list, but watch my Like It and Plot video if you want to hear some fascinating facts about the top 10 companies in the world. Now let's hear CL's history. Colgate Palmolive has actually two histories that are relevant, that of Colgate and that of Palmolive. Let's start with Colgate. William Colgate was born in England in 1783. He emigrated to the U.S. with his family, and they set up their residence in Maryland. There, William started making soap and candles while working in a soap manufacturing shop. When he was 16 years old, he left home to seek out new adventures in New York City. Part of his journey was on a boat, and the story goes that when he told the captain of the ship that he planned to make soap in New York City, the captain gave him the following advice. Someone will soon be the leading soap maker in New York. You can be that person, but you must never lose sight of the fact that the soap you make has been given to you by God. Honor him by sharing what you earn. Begin by tithing all you receive. In New York, William apprenticed to a soap boiler and learned the various tricks of the trade of his employer. But he thought his boss was mismanaging the business, so in 1806 he started his own business making soap, starch, and candles under the name of William Colgate and Company. For some time after coming to New York, William Colgate attended worship with a congregation of Reverend Dr. Mason, a preacher of the Presbyterian Church. Colgate was a tither throughout his long and successful business career. He gave not the normal one-tenth of his earnings of Colgate soap products, but he gave one-half of all his income to the church. In 1857 he died, and his son Samuel Colgate took over. In 1872, Colgate created and sold a new innovation called Cashmere Bouquet, a perfumed soap. In 1873 they created Colgate Toothpaste, an aromatic toothpaste they sold in glass jars. In 1890, Colgate established a $1 million endowment at Madison University, who then changed their name to Colgate University. In 1896, Colgate put the toothpaste in tubes and named their product Colgate Ribbon Dental Cream. I don't know about you, but I like the sound of toothpaste more than dental cream. Though, come to think of it, toothpaste doesn't really sound that appealing. In 1908, they started the mass selling of toothpaste in tubes. Okay, now let's talk about how Palmolive came into existence. In 1864, Benedict Cable Johnson arrived in Milwaukee from Buffalo, where he had been working for the Beard Soap Works. With an advance from his old boss, Johnson established B.J. Johnson & Company to manufacture soap and other products. In 1898, his company created a new soap that used palm and olive oil as well as cocoa butter, which gave the soap a nice light green color that they called palm olive. It was wildly successful, in part due to their great advertising campaigns that promoted it as an exotic cleanser that would have been used in the age of the pharaohs. By the early 1900s, Palm Olive was the world's best-selling soap, and another soap manufacturer known as Peat Brothers merged with Palm Olive to form the Palm Olive Peat Company. In 1928, Palm Olive Peat acquired the Colgate Company to create the Colgate Palm Olive Peat Company. In 1953, Peat was dropped from the name, leaving only Colgate Palm Olive Company, the current name. In 1978, they IPO'd on the New York Stock Exchange. And then Colgate acquired a variety of companies during the decades to follow, such as in 2006 when they acquired Tom's, a leading manufacturer of natural toothpaste. Okay, let's look at some of their current business strategies. In their 10K, they said that their goal is to have sustainable, profitable growth worldwide, enabled by three priorities. Number one, drive organic sales growth. Number two, maximize productivity. Number three, have an effective deployment of cash flow. Also in their 10K, they said they plan to achieve sales growth by number one, engaging with consumers, Number two, developing world-class innovation. Number three, working with retail partners. So they're doing things such as evolving their advertising so that people feel more emotionally connected with their brand. Here are some examples of what they're doing to maximize productivity. 
In Mexico, they installed a new fully automated production line for liquid cleaners that does everything from blow molding the bottle to labeling it to filling it all in one line. As a result, they've increased production speed by 44% with cost savings of 32%. Another example is they've invested in high-speed toothpaste filling equipment, which now enables filling at a rate of 750 tubes per minute versus where they were 10 years ago at 450 tubes per minute. Also in their 10K, they called out that they're looking at every line on their income statement to identify margin improvement opportunities as well as look for efficiency gains. They also said that they plan to utilize their cash flow to effectively enhance shareholder return while staying true to their culture and shareholder focus, all of which I love to hear. Another productivity enhancement they are doing is utilizing big data to help identify opportunities to drive efficiencies and growth. They are mining their own data to identify products that generate the most sales per point of distribution, amongst other useful pieces of information. And they've partnered with Google to help them. As they improve their existing products, they are raising prices. So they are doing things such as redesigning their packaging. They are also relaunching existing product suites, such as their pet food, which includes new and better recipes, new shapes, and other improvements. But their pricing gains were somewhat muted due to increased competition in some markets, as well as less than anticipated inflation in emerging markets. Their growth and efficiency initiatives are being managed under a program called the Global Growth and Efficiency Program. So you can bet that they have strong management ownership to each initiative, that they have scorecards and metrics they are utilizing, as well as targets they are reporting to their board. They project savings of over one half a billion dollars on these initiatives. Part of their growth and efficiency initiatives include, number one, expanding commercial hubs, where they will be streamlining operations in order to drive smarter and faster decision making, strengthening capabilities available on the ground and improving cost structure. Number two, extending shared business services and streamlining global functions, where they are optimizing the company's shared service organizational model in all regions of the world and are continuing to streamline global functions to improve cost structure. Number three, optimizing global supply chain facilities, where they are continuing to optimize manufacturing efficiencies, global warehouse networks, and office locations for greater efficiency, lower cost, and speed to bring innovation to market. And number four, simplifying and standardizing how works gets done by increasing technology-enabled collaboration and taking advantage of global data and analytical capabilities, leading to smarter and faster decisions. They are also investing in e-commerce as another growth strategy. E-commerce sales were up 30% in 2018 and represented 5% of overall sales. They can utilize e-commerce to penetrate into new markets more easily. In fact, some of their brands, like Elmex Toothpaste in China, are only available online. Speaking of toothpaste, Colgate helped set a Guinness World Record in 2007 when over 40,000 school children in the Philippines brushed their teeth at the same time in 13 different locations spread all over the nation. Okay, let's jump into their financials. There are four key financial areas I like to understand when I'm analyzing a business, and they are number one, is the company growing? Number two, can the company cover what it owes in the next year? Number three, do they have too much debt? And number four, how's their profitability? Let's start with number one. Now there are six main things I like to review when answering the question, is a company growing? Number one, is revenue growing? Number two, are earnings growing? Number three, is equity growing? Number four, is cash flow growing? Number five is the dividend growing, and number six is the stock price growing. So let's start with number one of six. Let's look at the revenue growth history for both CL and CHD on macrotrends.net, Guru Focus, Yahoo Finance, and Zacks. Here we see that in 2016, Colgate's revenues were 15.2 billion, which is 5.2% less than 2015. In 2017, the revenues were 15.45 billion, which is 1.7% greater than 2016. And in 2018, the revenues were 15.54 billion, which is 0.6% greater than 2017. We see that the 2020 estimate for revenue is 16.1 billion, which is 3.2% greater than 2019. For CHD's revenue, in 2016, we see 3.5 billion, which is 2.9% greater than 2015. In 2017, they had 3.8 billion in revenue, which is 8.1% greater than 2016. And in 2018, they had 4.1 billion in revenue, which is 9.8% greater than 2017. Their 2020 estimate for revenue is 4.65 billion, which is 5.9% greater than 2019. 
So I really like CHD's revenue trend here. CL pretty much has full market penetration and thus finding more organic growth will be very challenging. It'll be fascinating to see if CL can eke out that 3.2% go forward revenue goal for 2020. If so, then their pricing, e-commerce, efficiency, and innovation strategies are paying dividends, lol. Part of what is happening is that the demand for their products have grown, even though they are raising prices. So that is probably why shareholders have been more keen on CL over the last 12 months. Now let's dive into their business segments. Colgate Palmolive operates in four product segments. Number one, oral care. Number two, personal care. Number three, pet nutrition. And number four, home care. Let's understand their product line contribution to revenue. So oral care products are 40% of their total sales. So I'm talking about brands like Colgate toothpaste. Personal care is 20%, which include things like Irish spring soap. Home care is 18% and includes Ajax and Palmolive. And pet nutrition is 15% with brands like Science Diet. Let's dive deeper into their sales. Here we can see how their sales is trending by business segment as well as geographically. We see that Europe is trending up and everything else is rather stagnant, with Latin America trending down slightly. I believe this was due to currency exchange issues. But this chart really helps explain why I love Colgate so much. Most of their revenues are coming internationally, so it pushes my international exposure up in a way I feel comfortable with. My portfolio is very US centric by design, so even though Colgate lags on some of the metrics that matter, it rocks in terms of geographical revenue generation. And that's one of the reasons I like it as part of my portfolio in a relatively smaller position. Of all the other companies out there that they compete against, including companies like Procter & Gamble or Kimberly Clark or CHD and such, SEAL has some of the best international revenue. Granted, you need to be aware how currency exchange fluctuations can impact them more. That being said, in their 10K, they indicated that they expect global macroeconomic market conditions to remain challenging. So the not so subtle subtext is that I don't expect to see trends materially shifting anytime soon, even with their strategies and initiatives in place. Okay, number two of six are earnings growing. Let's look at CL's net income trending over time and compare that to CHD's. So for CL, we see that in 2016, net income was 2.4 billion, which is 76.4% greater than 2015. In 2017, net income was 2.02 billion, which was 17.1% less than 2016. And in 2018, net income was 2.4 billion, which is 18.6% greater than 2017. And then for CHD, we see that in 2016, net income was 0.46 billion, which was 11.8% greater than 2015. In 2017, net income was 0.74 billion, which is 62% greater than 2016. And in 2018, net income was 0.57 billion, which is 23.5% less than 2017. I like CHD's overall trend better, as it's been consistent. CL is struggling to increase their net incomes, which is why they are currently aggressively pursuing strategies to both increase growth and efficiency. Let's review their profit by segment and geo to understand where profitability lies. So we see that Europe looks good, and cost cutting at corporate is happening and working, and pet nutrition looks reasonable. My guess is that they've been implementing efficiency initiatives to address the gradual downward trend in Latin America, Asia, Africa, and the oral, personal, and home care segment. Okay, on to number three of six, is equity growing? Here we see that CL's shareholders' equity is not that compelling. They have been buying back shares, but I still prefer to see an increasing shareholders' equity, like we see from CHD. Okay, so number four of six, is cash flow growing? to answer the question, is a company growing? Watch my previous videos if you want to dig deeper into the various cash flow nuances. Here we see that they both have had volatile net cash flow, with neither of them looking great, but CHD's is nicer. I'm not keen on seeing that Colgate hasn't been able to trend a growing cash flow. Their payout ratio has been creeping up slowly, which I also don't like to see. They are, however, reducing capex relative to sales, which is a step in the right direction. Additionally, they are investing heavily in acquisitions with PCA Skin, Ulta MD, and Philorgia all happening within the last two years, and which also helps explain some of what you see in the financial metrics. So hopefully their cash flow trends can improve with their various strategies they are employing. Okay, now let's move on to number five of six, is the dividend growing? Here we see that CL and CHD both have green spark lines over the last year, so that means that their share price today are higher than they were a year ago. 
Seal and CHD are both consumer staples, consumer packaged goods. Seal's dividend is currently at $1.68 versus CHD at $0.91. Cents. Seal's three-year dividend compound growth rate is 3.4% versus CHD, which is at an excellent 9.1%. Seal's five-year dividend compound annual growth rate that I pulled from a website is 4.3% versus CHD is at 8.6%. Seal's 10-year dividend compound annual growth rate that I pulled from a website is 7.8% versus CHD's amazing 26.2%. Seal's five-year dividend compound annual growth rate that I created manually is 4.32% versus CHD's 7.98%. Seal's dividend yield right now is 2.49% at the time I created the script. CHD's dividend yield right now is 1.22%. Seal's five-year dividend yield on cost is 3.63% versus CHD's 3.9%. Colgate's 10-year dividend yield on cost is 3.81% versus CHD's 2.63%, neither of which are good. Colgate's 20-year dividend yield on cost is 11.2% versus CHD's 128%, which is obviously awesome. And CL has a 57-year history of increasing their dividend versus CHD's, which is only 13 years, which is a big reason why I like CL as a dividend play more than CHD. They both have good payout ratios. Let's take a look at what's going on with share buybacks. So we see that both CL and CHD have been doing share buybacks. CL has lowered their share count by 22.5% over 13 years. CHD has lowered their share count by 13.6% over 8 years. But CL's trend looks a lot nicer as it's just a gradual slope down, whereas we see the volatility in CHD. I pulled this info from their 10K. It is useful to see what share price that Colgate management think it's worth buying at. So it looks like around $62. In 2018, the Colgate Board of Directors authorized the repurchase of shares having an aggregate purchase price of up to $5 billion. The shares are repurchased from time to time in open market or privately negotiated transaction at the company's discretion, subject to market conditions, customary blackout periods, and other factors. Finally, number six of six, is the stock price growing? To help us answer the question, is a company growing? Let's look at the total returns of CL compared to CHD and the S&P 500 using Dividend Channel's Total Return Strip Calculator. This models what would have happened if you invested 10K for a bit over a decade ago. I'm just showing dividends reinvested because that's a larger amount. CL would have had an average annual total return of 8.44% per year, taking you from 10K to 28K. SPY would have fared a bit worse with an average annual total return of 8.23%, taking your 10K to 27K, and CHA would have done the best by far with an average annual total return of 17.74%, taking your 10K to 81K. So CHD really shines here and is a great reason to think about it for your portfolio. Okay, now to the next item I like to look at when I'm analyzing a business. So number two, can the company cover what it owes in the next year, which is asking if it can cover its short-term debt obligations. I like to use the current ratio to, to determine that. It's important to compare ratios in the same industry due to fluctuations in what is normal. Here we see that CL is at 1.13 versus their industry median of 1.56 and they are ranked lower than 71% of their competitors. CHD is at 0.78 versus the same industry median of 1.56 and they are ranked lower than 87% of their competitors. So they are both within reasonable ranges with Colgate's ratio indicating a higher liquidity that is below industry median. And like I always say, please double check all numbers and chat with people smarter than me when you are considering investing. Number three, the next main item I like to look at when I'm analyzing a business is if it has taken on too much debt using the debt to equity ratio. If the ratio is greater than one, the majority of assets are financed through debt. If it's smaller than one, assets are primarily financed through equity. I like to see between 1 to 1.5. That being said, the appropriate debt to equity ratio varies depending on the industry because some industries use more debt financing than others. Capital intensive industries often have higher ratios. We see that Colgate is ranked higher than all of its competitors out there. Watch my previous videos to understand the nuances of negative debt to equity. Remember, debt to equity is total liabilities divided by total equity. So the buybacks are driving equity down, which can thus take it negative. 
We see that in 2019, CHD's debt to equity was 0.69 and ranked lower than 71% of its competitors. Of course, I don't like to see high debt to equity ratios, as it often means a business is pushing for fast growth with debt, which can be reasonable if interest rates are low, but then can become a problem once interest rates go back up. Okay, let's see if we think they can cover their interest payments, so let's see if EBIT's at a reasonable level. Looking at their latest EBITs, we see that CL's EBIT is at $3.53 billion and CHD's EBIT is at $0.81 billion. I normally like to see EBIT greater than or equal to three times net interest. Looking at CL's income statement, we find that their trailing 12-month interest is at $201 million, so we can see that it's covered. Looking at CHD's income statement, we find their trailing interest is at $76 million, so they are also covered. Okay, the number four final main item I like to look at when analyzing a business is to understand their profitability. Let's look at return on assets, ROA, as a measure of profitability. ROA will tell us how efficiently a company is squeezing profit from their assets. Return on assets is a measure of how well a company takes all the money it has and uses that to make more money. It's a metric which is used to calculate management's effectiveness to understand how much profit a company earns for every dollar of its assets. ROAs over 5% are generally what I look for. The higher the ROA, the higher the asset efficiency. Here we see that CL's ROA is 17.93% and CHD's is 9.8%. We see that CL is ranked higher than 94% of its competitors in its industry, which is at a 2.75% median ROA. So CL is really rocking it. We see that CHD is ranked higher than 84% of its industry, so they are lagging relative to CL. Okay, the next profitability metric we'll look at is net margin. I like the net profit margin because it's a decent metric and just a single figure to gauge how effectively management is running the business. Net profit margins vary depending on the type of industry you're in. Low margin businesses are things like grocery stores and airlines, which are often under 3%. Solid net profit margins can mean a stronger company that is able to survive hard times. Here we see that CL's net margin is at 14.77% and CHD is only slightly less at 14.26%. We see that the industry median is only 2.82%. So we see that CL is better than 90% of its competitors and CHD is right behind it at better than 89% of them. Colgate can help their profitability with some of their acquisitions they're doing and plan to do, assuming they buy high margin and high growth businesses. Okay, let's move from their financials to community involvement, charitable giving, and their environmental, social, and governance work, along with any special entities they might support. CL has made a strong commitment to sustainability. Their Bright Smiles, Bright Futures oral health program has reached over 1 billion children in over 80 countries since 1991. This global health initiative of theirs provides free dental screenings and oral health education and helps encourage health practices like brushing your teeth daily. I'm going to have to see if I can get my kids enrolled in that. The program's next goal is to reach 1.3 billion children by 2020. Colgate makes significant contributions to a variety of charities. For example, their Hills Food, Shelter, and Love program has provided pet food to over 1,000 pet shelters and helped more than 10 million pets find their forever homes. Aww. They've made a commitment to have 100,000 of their packaging as recyclable at the end of 2025. Through their actions, they have helped avoid 9 million pieces of oral care waste from going into our landfills. Seven of their facilities have the Green Business True Zero Waste Certification. They have also purchased 220,000 megawatt hours of renewable energy credits from Kansas Wind Farms. In 2011, Colgate Palmolive was one of the first companies recognized by PETA for companies that test on animals only when mandated by government regulations and are actively seeking alternatives to animal testing. This relates to the corporation's decision to continue to participate in the profitable Chinese market where some animal testing is still a regulatory requirement. So as you can see, they are serious about their sustainability efforts. Okay, let's move on to their executive leadership team. The average tenure across their most senior execs averages 27 years, which is incredible. Their CEO is Ian Cook, a 44-year employee of Colgate. That's insane. He has been CEO since 2007. During his tenure, he has worked in a variety of roles, including Chief Operating Officer. Okay, one way we can assess a CEO is on how his stock has done since he has taken office. Here we see CL in black, Spy in blue, and Church in white and purple. 
What we see is that Colgate has underperformed relative to Spy and to Church and Dwight, and Church and Dwight has blown them both out of the water. I also did some research into Church and Dwight's top management and found some interesting history for their CEO. I won't go into it here, but I always recommend you research a company's top leadership. Okay, let's jump into concerns and risks. There are a variety of risks you need to be aware of that can impact a company like Colgate Palmolive, and I'll cover some of them. One concern I have is if a powerhouse like Amazon comes out with super cheap Amazon toothpaste and other products, I wonder how companies like Colgate can respond. Another risk is their international revenue. While I love seeing that they get about 70% of their revenue from markets outside the U.S., as geographic diversity helps reduce exposure in any one country, that also means they can be impacted by foreign currency exchange rates, political and economic instability, etc. And we saw this in Latin America where their numbers were seemingly negatively impacted by currencies. So while I still like the global diversification, it's important to understand the currency risks. If the dollar remains strong, then things can be challenging for Colgate from a currency perspective. A strong dollar decreases exports because U.S. products seem more expensive to foreign consumers. A weak dollar increases exports because U.S. products seem cheaper to foreign consumers. Raw and packaging material commodities such as resins, pulp, essential oils, tropical oils, tallow, poultry, corn, and soybeans can increase their costs and ultimately their profit margins. Recently we saw their operating margins negatively impacted due to increased material costs. Natural disasters and extreme weather can impact their supply chain, which can impact their financials. Things like Brexit could impact them because that could impact disruptions in trade and the free movement of goods to and from the UK. That being said, Colgate stated that they didn't think that Brexit would have a material impact to their operations. One risk I see is that using pricing as a lever for bottom line growth only helps so much, whereas more volume is a lot better. But their market penetration is so high it may be challenging to get significant more growth. Their cash flow is a concern as I've previously elaborated. Now, unlike many other companies, it's possible a recession fear could actually help boost sales stock as well as other consumer staples, as people tend to rush to where they believe will be the most safe, defensive investments. So that could lead to new all-time highs for CL, at least as long as the bubble keeps expanding. Regulatory and tax changes could impact them in a positive or negative way. Adverse outcomes of litigation could impact them. There is an issue they have with an old acquisition of an oral care business, where the tax authorities in Brazil are attempting to collect some revenues. I won't go into the details, but Colgate is fighting it in court because the amount in question isn't negligible. Colgate management believes, based on the opinion of its Brazilian legal counsel, that the tax assessment is without merit and that CL should ultimately prevail. Colgate has been named in a defendant in civil actions alleging that certain talcum powder products that were sold prior to 1996 were contaminated with asbestos. There is also a class action claiming that residual annuity payments made to certain participants in the Colgate Palmolive Company Employees Retirement Income Plan did not comply with the Employee Retirement Income Security Act. As they've become more dependent on technology, then outages or cybersecurity incidents could negatively impact them. Someone asked me if I could elaborate on how a company could be impacted by cybersecurity beyond the bad press. So here are some possibilities. Colgate utilizes technology to communicate with others in their company, along with customers and suppliers. They use technology for ordering and managing materials. They use it for order processing and shipping and marketing. They utilize technology for banking. So a security incident could cause systems to be brought down, even though they have a business continuity plan in place. Incidents could cause huge legal fees, brand impacts, and supply chain disruptions, as some examples. There's a saying in the security industry that there are two types of company in the world, the ones that have been hacked and the ones that don't realize they've been hacked. Another risk to be aware of is, is that they're becoming increasingly dependent on certain retailers, which can limit their bargaining powers. So for example, approximately 11% of their total sales came from Walmart in 2018. And of course, they have a slew of competition worldwide from companies like Church and Dwight and others and the rise in e-commerce has enabled easier entry for newer competitors and business models. So those are some of the risks you might want to consider in your investing decisions. So big question, is it worth buying at today's price? Using this DCF calculator, we see that Colgate has a fair value of $28.15 versus its stock price of $68.41, which is a minus 143% margin of safety, 
i.e. it's overpriced. The defaults used are a $2.63 earnings per share, 10 years of growth rate at 5%, a 4% terminal growth rate, 10 years of terminal growth, and a discount rate of 12%. This says that Church & Dwight's DCF fair value is $43.64 versus a stock price of $74.89, which gives it a minus 71.6% margin of safety. Thus, it is also overpriced. So if you were using just these calculators, you would say that Church & Dwight is a better value, but both are too pricey. And remember, you can go to the calculator and change the default assumptions to see how the fair value is impacted. Let's look at their price to earnings. Watch my previous video to learn some nuance about PEs and what I expect to see in different industries. Here we see the Colgate Palmolive's PE is a spendy 26.01 versus its industry PE of 19.16, so I put it in red. Its go forward PE is okay at 19.16. Church and Dwight's PE is spendy at 31.2 versus the same industry at 19.16. So Church and Dwight is even pricier than Colgate Palmolive, which is also pricey. Remember that the average P across the S&P 500 is around a 22. Watch my AVI video if you want to learn more about the S&P 500 PE ratios. Okay, another trend you might want to look at is how their dividend yield has trended over time as an input into your buying decisions. Here are the last 10 years of dividend yield trends for Colgate Palmolive and Church and & Dwight. Colgate Palmolive is at an okay 2.51% yield and Church and & Dwight is at a low 1.22%. Remember that yield equals their annual dividend they pay out divided by share price. So if this line is flat, then it's one indicator that its relative value has stayed flat when looking at this metric in isolation. If the line trends downhill, then it probably indicates that it is getting pricier, and if it trends up, then it indicates that it is potentially becoming more of a value play worth considering. It will have a tendency to trend up if they increase their annual dividend payout, or if the share price goes down. It will trend down if the share price goes up relative to the dividend payout. So the ideal is to buy the yield when it's high and then see the line trend down because the share price is going up after you buy it. Of course, if the share price goes down, then your drip can buy more shares. So between the share price and annual dividend changes, the relative value of Colgate Palmolive hasn't changed significantly in the last 10 ish years. Let's look at what analysts at MarketBeat are thinking about Colgate Palmolive and Church and Dwight. So Colgate Palmolive's consensus rating today is a hold and six months ago is a hold. Their share price today is $68.41 and their price target for today is $73.77. Their price target for six months ago was $69. Church and Dwight's consensus rating today is a hold. Six months ago was also a hold. Their share price today is $74.89 and Church and Dwight's consensus price target today is $71.59, and their price target six months ago was $66.11. So they're saying that Colgate Palmolive has some room to run up, whereas Church and Dwight, they see downside risk, but none of those are significant enough to move off a hold. Now let's look at insider trading. I don't like seeing that insiders have been selling. I'd rather see buys. Not unusual for execs to sell to diversify and such, but I get excited when I see buys by insiders to show that they really believe in the upside of their company. Oh well, I'm sure I would be doing the same if I worked there. I personally feel Colgate Palmolive is a bit too pricey given everything. If it fell under $60 then I'd get interested in investing more due to all the pros and cons and risks in my personal portfolio, risk tolerances, goals, etc. That all being said, how many manufacturing companies do you know of that have operating margins over 20%? Of course, as we get closer to the recession bell ringing, I could see people driving more investments into things like Colgate Palmolive, as consumer staples as a whole are the safer places to run to. So overall, I still like them in my portfolio for the long run, but I'm not actively investing more in it right now, other than my drip. So what do you think? Are you a bull or a bear on Colgate Palmolive? Are you going to buy, hold, or sell? I think Colgate Palmolive is worth considering for a portfolio at the right price. As always, this video is not a recommendation to buy. I'm just sharing my thoughts as someone who isn't a professional or licensed wealth manager or investor. So any decisions or actions you take or don't take are your own responsibility. And you can't hold me liable for them. Don't rely on this research to be accurate. Anything anyone tells you on YouTube usually merits deeper research on your own using multiple other sources. All right, let's jump into the portfolio here and we will start with the pie allocations. 
And so we see that we added with Colgate Palmolive consumer staples, consumer packaged goods at 14.6% right here. And then industrials is about 25%, entertainment 5%, energy is about 7%, financials 14.5%, retail 157 and healthcare about 18 And then as we scroll in, so one thing we notice here is that Leggett, they announced earnings today and because of that, they're up 12%, about, about, I guess about 11%. And so in my portfolio, they actually swap spots with Colgate Palmolive, which you see right here. Um, so Colgate, we have 651.1 shares. And we see that its spark line is in green, so it's up for the year. We see its forward PE is spendy at 23. 91, Ford PE 2288, consumer staples, it pays an annual dividend of $1.72, and the increase date we already had this year, it's going to pay out on November 15th. Currently, the dividend yield is 2.53%, the three-year dividend compound annual growth rate is 3.4%, Five-year dividend compound annual growth rate that I pulled from a website is 4.3%, and when I calculated it manually, I got 4.32%, and the 10-year dividend compound annual growth rate is 7.8%. We see that the average weighted portfolio five-year dividend compound annual growth rate is 11.6%, and the average weighted dividend yield for the portfolio, or the starting yield of the portfolio, is 3.03%. And then I have $44,000 of Colgate Palmolive, and you can see that leg shot above it, now it's at 48000 So you can see that these 11 stocks of the 25 in my portfolio have a portfolio value of 302000 And we see that Colgate drips $1,120 a year, and so these 11 stocks drip $9,164 per year. See a decent payout ratio. It has 57 years of consecutive dividend increases, which is incredible. And we see the average weighted years of increasing dividends in the portfolio is 29.6 years. It's an aristocrat. We see that Colgate's beta is 0.75, and we see the average weighted beta for the portfolio is 0.99. And market cap, about 58 billion, and the average weighted market cap, 105.94 billion. Okay, let's review dividends. I included dividends I received from Colgate in August for your reference. I have Colgate Palmolive in both a tax sheltered account and in a taxable account, so I got two emails from each rate showing dividends I received. I also edited out some dividends from these screenshots from companies I haven't revealed to you yet. So in August, I received a total of $308.22 of Colgate dividends. Since I've turned on my drip for Colgate Palmolive, it bought another 4.3 shares of itself taking me from 646.8 shares to 651.1 shares. Those additional shares I got this quarter took the Colgate Palmolive contribution of my annual passive income from about $1,112 a year up to $1,120 a year. So this dividend payout just increased my annual passive income by about $8 a year just for this quarter. Thus, you can easily infer that each year that I hold Colgate Palmolive in my brokerage, it will increase my overall portfolio's passive income by over $32 cumulatively every year, which should also continuously increase as it compounds itself and as they increase their dividend. So after I filmed my portfolio update, Starbucks announced that they were increasing their dividend from $0.36 cents a share to $0.41 cents a share, which is a 13.9% increase payable November 29th for shareholders of record on November 13th and which goes ex-dividend on November 12th. 
As you might know, that's part of why I'm called Gen X Dividend Investor, because I love those X dividend days. So that means my Starbucks annual passive income goes from $439 a year up to $500 a year, which is another $61 a year of passive income. And that is why dividend investing is by far the most passive income out there. Thanks, and if you are one of those incredible people that actually made it to this part of the video, then please include the phrase, I watched it all, in your comment below, so I can see who the most supportive people in the community are. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next video. Remember, I'm not a financial advisor, and these videos are for entertainment, inspiration, and educational purposes only. Investing of any kind involves a risk. I am only sharing my opinion with no guarantee of gains or losses on investments. Don't use this information without double checking it and talking to someone a lot smarter than me after you completely understand it. So I'll see you in the next video and remember to stay positive, patient, play for the long term, keep investing in great companies, budget reasonably, and win. I know you can do it. Just like I know you can hit the subscribe, like, and bell icons, share this video with others, and comment below.